Caddis Maximus here. This time we have a classic Porter cable. Now this is a true classic. How you know is one is this kind of older style bold font label. The other thing is you know it's an original Porter cable before the set, before they were bought out because it's made in Syracuse, New York rather than Jackson, Tennessee. This is a half inch drill advertised as a heavy duty drill and cursive. Although it's pretty weak in the world. You know people really kind of get stuck on the die cast aluminum body but this is pretty weak if we look it really is half inch capacity 750 rpm at 3.6 amps that's just uh, that's very low power <laughs> even back in this era the milwaukee's were you know milwaukee had 500 rpm 4.5 amp drills so this is on the weaker side Jacobs actually lost their patent on their chucks uh, along their three jaw chucks a long time ago. There's been many competitors, and back in the 70s, the Rigid Supreme. So this just says Supreme here, and I think it'll say. Uh, actually, this doesn't actually say Rigid, but it was a Rigid Supreme chuck. One of the first companies to really start making knockoffs. They're okay, but they're not quite as good as Jacobs. One of the reasons Jacobs is so dominant is one, quality, and two, they were just willing to accept a little bit less overhead. And so they're able to continue with sales by saying not only you're getting like the original and the premium chucks, but you're also getting them for a good deal. Anyway, we'll do a little tear down of this Porter Caber drill. We'll see how heavy duty it really is, see how many uh, elements are actually ball and needle bearings and how many are sleeve bearings. I knew it was something worth picking up just because um, there's lots of these old aluminum body drills. Admittedly, they don't say heavy duty on them and they aren't Porter Cable, but Cummins, when just so many different brands that are just sleeve bearing drills. They're cheap drills with die cast aluminum bodies. One of the ways you can tell is by trying to pull the spindle in and out because if it has a sleeve bearing, it will move in and out. This definitely at least has one ball bearing up in front. It's pretty easy to turn the drill if we. Just look, you can see how the motor is moving in the opposite direction. And since it's a slower speed half inch drill, it's not going to be a single reduction. If it was a double reduction with one idler gear, then the motor would spin in the same direction as the spindle. So this is a triple gear reduction drill. Has some issues with the cord. Has a in mold, an over molded strain relief. So I'm going to have to figure out something in order to replace the cord, but it does work. So, all right, we'll do my user drilling demonstration. We got a one inch auger bit here. I was kind of realizing that this whole boss square odd thing on the bottom of it, maybe just something to grip onto since it isn't that particularly powerful at 3.6 amps. Um, and the 750 RPM, you know, it seems optimized really to run a half inch bit through steel. And really, that's all, you know, the grip you need. The side handle is just so small and insignificant. Anyway, let's just see how it runs here. There we go. But now it really caught up and unfortunately don't have a reverse. Forgot to hit start. Actually, I was able to stall, out, stall it out by hand. This piece that got caught on the outside of the bit, it was what was causing all that extra friction. Making it have such a hard time. And yeah, just holding on to this with a firm grip. Um, in a steady footing and you'll be able to effectively stall it out. I'll do one more hole that won't be quite through the whole cross section. I'll do a crossways this way so that way when it hits this opening you'll be able to clear out some of the chips and should have a little bit easier time of it. You could still hear it bogging down, but it was pulling through, and that's exactly the kind of situation that makes a tool actually heavy duty. 
is the fact that it can be run bogged way down like that, more than 30%, probably 50%. I also suspect that if I had a power meter, that it was probably drawing more than 3.6 amps, uh, especially when it was bogging down. And it gets a lot of airflow. One more haul. I got the ubiquitous P3 kilowatt, which are pretty common in YouTube videos. Got it to set the amps. Try this crossways again. We'll see what it gets up to. You saw the numbers that was jumping up to. It actually, I think I saw 7 amps, which would be... Or a little over 7 amps, which would be double the rated, uh, whatever it is, 3.6 amps. That's actually kind of surprising. And finishing through the other side, I saw it jump up to 6. So, this thing, even though it's rated for 3.6 amps, can pull a lot more juice and deliver a lot more power when it really needs to. Let's take a look at the gearbox. Should mention this drill is Phillips head screws, so that does show you helps date the tool just because of the when Phillips head screws started becoming uh, relatively common. Re much, you know, older drills would all have flathead fasteners. Sometimes on these aluminum housing drills, uh, these screws can you know there can be a little bit of you know, humidity and corrosion. These steel screws in the aluminum can just get. I mean, when aluminum starts oxidizing, it forms, you probably heard of it, aluminum oxide. It's used in grinding wheels and sandpaper. When aluminum oxide forms in threads around, or around the threads of a steel fastener, it can lock them in pretty darn tight. These came out with relatively little fanfare. And, gotta try to work this gearbox. This obviously has not come apart in a long time, so it's just going to take a lot of wiggling and fudging. The gearbox halves don't really don't want to come apart, so I'm going to have to pull the kind of the motor with the diaphragm. Anyway, traditional old school switch. Really like these old switches; they were really pretty nice. I wonder if we can see, or if I can't see, what the rating of this switch is. It's a 3.6 amp tool. Got to get a magnifying glass. So this is indeed a 6 amp 250 volt rated switch on a 3.6 amp nominally rated tool. So nicely over spec They were really worried in the older days on how well the switches would really work out until they really learned from years and years of manufacturing power tools that they could get away with much smaller switches than they needed to. Here's a classic motor design. We can see welded contacts, pretty well guarded motor, wrapped field. Motors really were built a little bit better uh, on the old days just because once again they wanted to make sure that they really lasted until they learned that they could just use crimped fittings and just a little bit of epoxy and they basically last about as long as um, the much more expensive older school motors pull out these brushes and they still have some life left in them quick tip if you ever you really want to get brushes put in it's kind of hard to see come on camera but you can see the brush is not war does not have quite geez stupid light does not have quite symmetrical wear and so if you put them in backwards it'll make a terrible noise for a while until they but you can do something like you can see how one side is totally black and one side has this discoloration that's going to be on the trailing edge so you just figure out which direction the motor turns in this case if you're looking through the handle you the motor turns counterclockwise so you would put this discolored portion of the brush facing the trailing direction of the motor and that's how you can ensure that you get the brushes in uh, the correct direction. Definitely a ball bearing on the back of the motor. This ball bearing doesn't feel super great. That grease is really hard so I'll put a little, a little I'll keep this bearing and put a little bit of fresh grease on there. 
pulling it out, the bearing came out of the front a little bit too. In this situation, to start to get the gear case to split and not actually just do a whole bunch of damage since they're totally, you know, together flush, is I actually just have an old knife blade. And actually, I'll just get that right in the little crevice there and then just tap it. And that basically uses the knife blade as a wedge, but it just has a sharp enough edge to actually squeeze into that little gap and start these things separating without trying to drive a screwdriver or something in there and really dinging it up. Well, those that was tight. Really had to put a lot of effort to get this thing apart. And uh, it's apparent why. It's actually all ball bearing construction in here. It is indeed triple reduction. This old drill is greasy. There's that bearing. And so since they were all and really tight fitting bores I, when I was trying to pull it apart I was actually having to pull against this bearing that bearing and this bearing all three of them the primary idler, idler gear actually did come out by itself just like so and what we can see is helical cut gears on the first stage that would be for the motor just to make it a little bit quieter because that's the highest speed and then they go to straight cut gears. And yes, you know, it, it does qualify as heavy duty because all, it has eight ball bearings. There are no needle bearings. They're actually using all ball bearings, surprisingly enough. One on each side of this primary idler gear. And uh, that's actually kind of surprising. And when you're inspecting these tools, you really want to take a close look at the gears to evaluate their wear and usually it's actually the smaller gears, not the larger ones, that experience the wear because they have more load and they have fewer teeth relative to the, the larger bowl gear that they're engaging. So they tend to wear faster. So you just want to take a real close look. You can usually see how, you know, this one has just a little bit of wear, but it's not too bad. And same thing on this one. You just want to see how much of the flat is. See if the teeth are really sharp. See where the gear's been riding. It'll leave like a little lip um, right at the top and bottom of the tooth. Because usually they don't fully... The bull gear is a little bit narrower than the engaging gear. So you just want to look and see if there's, you know, a, just a big recess that's been worn in those gears. And these they actually look just fine. So there is really greasy besides a gasket there's this machine lip which sits inside here which maintains relative concentricity and it has pretty tight holes with the screws and for some reason they have this like extra long boss so that kind of disproportionately helps provide alignment there isn't specifically alignment pins which is a big deal because you don't want these gears to get cantered back and forth but in this case you have good centering do this machined ring and to prevent any twist just tightly machined holes and the screws there are, when you reassemble this it's going to be just about exactly the way it was before although it would have been nice to see some alignment pegs just to ensure that when you reassemble it there just isn't any way for it to become misaligned but on these older tools I mean these screws here surprisingly enough Probably just the, you can see how little play there is in that screw and so that's probably how they're really you know justified not having an alignment peg in this particular or these particular old heavy duty units is just because of real precise machining around the fasteners that they're as tight as any alignment peg would end up uh, getting you so I'm gonna put some grease in here clean this up a little bit figure out something with the power cord and then do a little drilling demonstration and just so you know how I've managed to deal with the wires, I found a strain relief that fits just right. Have the wire use a couple of double lock zip ties really tight to prevent the wire from pulling through, but there's still the issue of twisting. So I found like a little piece of rubber here and managed to jam that. What I did is I put a little piece of double sided sticky tape on the inside of the little piece of rubber, taped that around the wire, 
and kind of pushed my fingers, yanked up with the strain relief and pulled the wire all at the same time. So it kind of jammed that piece of rubber down in there. So now, sorry about the lighting. So now with that piece of rubber really jammed in there, what it does is it kind of locks the, puts a bunch of friction so that the wire will twist on the outside but not on the inside. So I don't have to worry about stressing right here where it uh, terminates. Plus the strain relief is just a touch too big, but it's almost perfect. I mean, I collect these from power tools that are not repairable, but I keep the strain release and this happened to be just right. So when I put the case halves together, I'll actually compress this a little bit. And this will be a viable solution. Prevent the wire from pulling through and it won't be able to twist around. We'll go ahead and finish it out there. It definitely started to heat up. I mean, it was pulling a lot more amps than it's rated continuous 3.6 amps. So it was pulling around 2 to 2.2 freewheeling. So 3.6 would be the full load amps. But once again, shows you how dynamic brushed motors can be. That when it really started to bog down, it was pulling five, six, even peaking at seven amps near stall. So this definitely can surge a lot of extra power. Actually drilling holes all day in July in Phoenix where it's 110 degrees, you'd probably risk burning up the drill just because of how hot it would get under those kind of houses, those kind of conditions. And much cooler weather, if you're drilling a bunch of holes like that when it was 40 degrees outside or 30 degrees then the air would be more than cool enough to keep the whole tool cool and that's probably one of the last advantages really of the aluminum housing is aluminum housing versus the plastic which is insulating on most modern tools they really try to make up for it by having very aggressive fans this also does have a lot of airflow but the whole aluminum housing is a big heat sink plus this has like um, billet machine brush gu uh, brass brush guides and a lot of other stuff that allows it just to take you know a bit of extra heat and now you also see why like when I do teardowns why it's uh, I feel so good when I see things like this tool which has a six amp rated tr trigger switch because many times you actually need a switch that's far more than the nameplate to ensure all so it is also reliable when the tool is surging heavy loads. Anyway, just thought this Porter Cable 372 was just a cool, compact, actually well-built, eight ball bearing, triple reduction, half inch drill. Hard to find information online about these older Porter Cables. Old tool, especially power tools, people are a bit more into hand tools because hand tools are just pieces of metal and they see, they're, idea that they are essentially something that lasts forever where electrical tools don't quite have the same I guess it wouldn't be pedigree but people don't feel the same way about them so people just don't document these old tools like they do you know all day long you can find information on any snap-on tool from the 1920s or the 1930s search for a Porter Cable 372 that was one of the originals from Syracuse New York you can't even find a picture of one on Google Images, much less any links to one of these. As far as the internet's concerned, basically, this drill never existed. But of course it did, and if you run into one of these oddball porter cable heavy-duty drills, it'd be worth picking up. And it's really easy to see through the vents to see if the commentator's all worn out or anything like that. Really easy to turn it to see if there's any notches or crunchiness in the gears. I pick one up. D-handle drills are nice because your hand's in line with the spindle of the drill, so it's actually just much more comfortable drilling with it. And surprisingly enough, rather than having your hand cantilevered, it's easier to actually maintain a straight hole, whether you're doing horizontal or vertical. Anyway, really appreciate everybody watching. See you next time.